Coming up on Citrus TV News, New York has many new faces, both in the state government and at the federal level. What happened on Election Day and what it means for the country. And Jeff Sessions resigned this afternoon. Why the Attorney General left his position and what comes next? And a Guinness World Record is broken. Why this Indian city lit up the night with thousands of lamps. Citrus TV News starts right now. Citrus TV News live at 6, your campus news leader. Yesterday, voters across the country took to the polls to cast their vote in gubernatorial, House, Senate, and local elections. Good evening. I'm Jack Watson. And I'm No Eagle. The Democratic Party had huge victories here in New York as the party took full control of the New York State Assembly. Democrats also managed to flip several House seats with Anthony Brandisi's victory in the 24th District and Antonio Delgado in the 19th. That's right. Governor Andrew Cuomo also won last night. This will be his third consecutive term as the governor of New York. And we go now to Brandon Ross in studio with a report on the elections across New York State. Brandon? Yeah, Jack, plenty of election results from around the country and, of course, right here in New York. Statewide, nothing shocking by any stretch to term Governor Andrew Cuomo, like he just said, won a third term last night over his Republican challenger, Mark Molinaro. It wasn't particularly close either, with Cuomo taking it by a hefty 23-point margin. And if you think that race was a landslide, let's take a look at the result of New York Senate race. Democrat Kirsten Gillibrand won her re-election bid by 33 points. Democrats also managed to sweep all the other row offices as well. Now, there were a few surprises in some elections around the country last night, and here in the Empire State, we certainly got some of those as well. Let's start right here in central New York. Incumbent Republican John Kako did hold on to the 24th Congressional District, but he didn't hold on to it by much. The six-point win over Democrat Dana Balter sounds comfortable, but in context, it's pretty narrow. Kako won both of his past elections by over 20 points, and the last poll before Election Day had him up by 14. Shifting east now to New York's 22nd Congressional District. We knew it would be a tight one between incumbent Claudia Tenney and Democratic challenger Anthony Brindisi, but who'd have thought it'd come down to less than one point? Brindisi knocks out incumbent by a margin of 0.6%. People were curious how Tenney's decision to embrace the president during her campaign would play out. Big White House players even made a push to try and help her re-election bid. But in the end, it did not work out in Tenney's favor. She fell to Bryn Dizzy. And finally, moving further west to Buffalo, Republican Chris Collins managed to hold on to the 24th, rather the 27th Congressional District. Collins is facing federal charges of securities fraud and wire fraud related to insider trading. Democratic challenger Nate McMurray lost by less than 3,000 votes and may call for a recount, but it looks like Collins will be going back to Washington come January. All right, Brandon, you mentioned those three upstate races. Were there any surprises around the state of New York? Well, one other race that particularly surprised me was New York 11th. That's Staten Island, and it's very Republican, and the incumbent Dan Donovan actually lost his race. He had faced a tough challenger, rather a primary challenge from his predecessor, Michael Grimm. He won that primary, but he ended up losing the general shockingly to his Democrat challenger, Max Rose. All right, Brandon, thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming on. Now, a lot of those that lost the race, I guess you could say it was raining on their parade a little bit, but it was sunny here in central New York and here in Syracuse. Thankfully, finally, another sunny day. And Amber McElrath has our weather forecast. Amber? Yeah, guys, I feel like I'm always giving you really bad news when it comes to the weather. It's either raining or it's cold. But if you look here at central New York, it was sunny all day. Looking at today's highs, we saw pretty warm temperatures for November. 55 degrees in Syracuse, getting as warm as 60 in Elmira. So the rest of central New York had a beautiful day, just like we had here in Syracuse. And if we look at the current temperature, 45 degrees. Notice how this isn't a sun. That's because the sun set at 4.49 p.m., so it's a little after 6 and it's already dark outside. It feels like 38, so it's a little bit chillier than that 45 degrees, but for the most part, clear night, a little bit chillier, but not too bad. And we have some snow coming into the area this weekend. According to some... <clears throat> According to some meteorologists, the first infamous lake effect snow of the season could be coming in just a matter of days. A storm system moving east will end up pulling cold air down from Canada over the Great Lakes. What that means for us here in, is the potential for a few inches of snow on the ground in the Salt City. I'll have more with what you can expect with my full weather forecast later on in the show. Jack and Noah, back to you.
All right, Amber, thanks so much. The Student Association is organizing the first Thankful for Syracuse food drive this week. Donations will be split between the Food Bank of Central New York and the Hendricks Chapel Food Pantry to address hunger and food insecurity both in the Syracuse community and on campus. Donation boxes are located in the lobby of most residence halls, Shine Atrium, and many academic halls on campus. Venmo donations will also be accepted through Friday. Mostly we've had donations at Shine. I feel like a lot of students come into Shine and that's why there's more donations here. But I think the Venmo will be more effective since people are more likely to donate instead of going and purchasing the items themselves since they don't have time for students. This week, the SA president sent an email to all students with an attached flyer of all the donation box locations and the Venmo username. The SA Community Engagement co-chair say Thankful for Syracuse is the first event of its kind. It aims to combat the issues of food insecurity which exists in the Syracuse community and the university campus. A lot of people don't know that students also suffer from food insecurity. Like here on this campus, a lot of students can't even afford to go here. Like some people can't afford to eat, and I know that personally. So I like people to know that there are students struggling here, and if they can help, they should. Police arrested a third suspect in Texas in connection with last month's double homicide in SOTUS. Reports from the Syracuse Post Standard say suspect Bron Bowler is a Texas police officer. He was arrested in his Texas home last night and charged with second degree conspiracy. Detectives are continuing to investigate the deaths of Joshua Niles and Amber Washburn. And Santa might not be here quite yet, but the Clinton Square Evergreen Tree is coming to town this Friday. The route shown on this map will close roads that morning in the city of Syracuse and in Liverpool to make room for the tree. The tree lighting ceremony will be held after the, the Friday after Thanksgiving at 6.30 in the evening. For the 11th time, Applebee's is giving meals to vets on Veterans Day. This Sunday, veterans and active duty service people will need to show proof of service to get the free meals. The free dishes are dining only at Applebee's locations in the Syracuse area. According to a report from Syracuse.com, a judge is delaying the sentencing of hit and run suspect Anthony Saccone for the fourth time because his attorney is sick. The first delay came in October when Saccone attempted to withdraw his guilty plea and the judge further postponed sentencing when Saccone then fired his lawyer. Saccone is accused of killing three people close to Onondaga Community College in a car crash and then fleeing the scene in February. And New York State Police arrested a man for robbing a Rite Aid in North Syracuse last night. Police say William Green threatened the cashier of the store, demanding the employee give him the money in the register. Police arrested Green in his home less than 300 yards from the Rite Aid. Green faces a felony charge for third-degree robbery. And a 16-year-old boy is expected to spend 18 years in prison after allegedly shooting a rival gang member. Lamar Murray allegedly shot Jaquan Moore of the 18th Street Gang in his in December and has been awaiting trial since. Though he originally faced a life sentence, Murray entered a plea deal, reducing the charge to manslaughter. Murray's trial is set for this December. Western New York officials are saying a British man is pleading guilty in an investigating scam. The AP reports 47-year-old David Cole is accused of taking part in a scheme that deceived 250 investors and took $3 million. Cole is originally from England and could see 20 years in prison and a fine of a quarter million dollars. Coming up after the break, results of last night's midterm elections across the nation, how the most watched races ended and who will be a part of the 116th Congress. And fighting intensifies in a key port city in Yemen. All that and more, don't go away. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's smoky. It looks as if Smoky is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good stir. Next, another drink. Next, and next, finally, next, a close feel. Is it cool? cool? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch. Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. fouls are pretty dumb. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving, the ultimate party foul. They'll test you. 
try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait. And move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. If you see news happening on campus, in Syracuse, or across the nation, call the Citrus TV Newsroom, 315-443-1177, or tweet at Citrus TV News, your campus news leader. Welcome back to Citrus TV News. Last night, we found out the results of major gubernatorial House and Senate races from across the country. Republicans will retain control of the Senate, but there is now a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives. They won an additional 26 seats last night. Republican Ron DeSantis is now the governor of Florida, fending off a strong campaign from Democratic challenger Andrew Gillum. The race was tight, according to the Associated Press. DeSantis won with a 49.7% of the vote to Gillum's 49%. At around 11 p.m. last night, however, Gillum conceded the race to DeSantis. This is the fourth time a Republican governor has come out victorious since 1998. Mr. President, I look forward to working with you to advance Florida's priorities. I think you're going to get tired of me calling you, asking you for things for Florida, uh, but I look forward to that. I think we'll have a great partnership. We move to Florida's neighbors in the north in Georgia with another close race resulting in a Republican victory. With 100% of precincts reporting, Brian Kemp will likely be Georgia's next governor in a controversial election. And Kemp's opponent, Democrat Stacey Abrams, accused Kemp of supporting voter suppression throughout the campaign and is now calling for a recount. And I promise you tonight we're going to make sure that every vote is counted. Every single vote. And crucially for the GOP, Republicans will retain control of the Senate. One of the major races that ensured a red Senate was in Texas, where Republican incumbent Ted Cruz held on to a seat against Democrat Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke mounted one of the strongest Democratic campaigns for Texas Senate in recent years, but the Democratic drought in the state that began in 1988 will continue. But all the money in the world was no match for the good people of Texas and the hardworking men and women across our state. Democrats celebrated gubernatorial victories in Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, Nevada, and Colorado. Colorado, one of the many places that experienced an electoral first as they elected Jared Polis, the first openly gay governor in the United States. And a number, a record number of women will take office in the House of Representatives following this year's midterms. Current projections show 96 women will serve in the House, beating out the previous record by 11 representatives. The 116th Congress will also feature the first female Muslim representatives, one coming from Minnesota and the other coming from Michigan. Several Native American women will also represent districts in Kansas and New Mexico. And while many in politics are celebrating their new positions, some are on the way out. Attorney General Jeff Sessions resigned today under the pressure of President Trump. In a letter to the president, Sessions said he was honored to serve in the position, and Trump tweeted this afternoon thanking Sessions for his service. The relationship has been strained ever since Sessions recused himself of control of the Russia investigation. And Sessions' chief of staff, Matthew Whitaker, will become the acting attorney general until a permanent replacement is found. Health facilities across New Jersey are seeing cases of adenovirus infections rise after outbreaks at two separate health care facilities. According to the state health department, the first outbreak began in September, while the second happened in October. And the two outbreaks have led to a total of 35 cases uh, of infection and 10 deaths. The deaths are mostly children, although the infections have claimed a few adult victims. 
The scheduled meeting between a top North Korean official and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is now postponed. The two were supposed to meet in New York tomorrow, but reports said this meeting would be a precursor to another summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The U.S. and the two Koreas are in ongoing negotiations to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, and this cancellation is seemingly a roadblock in those talks. A U.N. official says that the violence in the port city of Hodeida in Yemen is escalating. The city is vital for the U.N. and other groups to provide humanitarian aid to the region. A few days ago, a U.S.-backed Saudi-led coalition reached Hodeida in its battle to capture the city. This comes after the United States called for peace talks to begin urging fighters to agree to a ceasefire. And according to Mexico's congressional website, medical marijuana may be on its way to Mexico. Senator Olga Sanchez is planning to submit legislation that will allow Mexican citizens to use marijuana both medically and recreationally. Sanchez told Reuters that Mexico's Congress will review the bill this week, and this would be a major step in ending the war on drugs. As Reuters reports, Mexico still supplies large quantities of marijuana illegally to parts of the United States. Moving to the northern border now as a cargo plane skidded off the side of a runway at the Halifax Stanfield, Stanfield International Airport. And according to the airport's Twitter account, four members of the crew were sent to the hospital. The incident happened around 5 this morning and the airport spokesperson said the cause is still unknown. The runway is closed until a full safety review can take place. And the Festival of Lights did not disappoint for those in the northern Indian city of Ayodhya. <laughs> Over 300,000 oil lamps were lit, doubling a Guinness World Record set by a neighboring city in 2016. And the lamps were lit in celebration for the Hindu festival of Diwali. Coming up after the break, we have your full weather forecast, so don't go away. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. From the Citrus TV Weather Center, this is SU's most accurate weather forecast. Welcome back to Citrus TV News. I joked earlier about having some bad news for you, and I do have slight bad news. It's going to get colder as we go into tomorrow. If you look at our future temperature radar, it's not going to be as warm as we saw today. That cold temperatures are just going to come through tonight and continue into tomorrow morning. And if we look at tonight's forecast, 35 degrees. So like I said earlier, it's going to be a little chillier tonight than we'd all hope, but there's a 0% chance of rain. So on the bright side, it's not going to be pouring on you in that colder weather. And there's going to be 11 mile per hour winds. So it's going to be a little bit breezy. And then looking at tomorrow, another sunny day, 42 degrees when you wake up, partly cloudy, 0% chance of rain. So we're going to be seeing the sun again tomorrow and having another beautiful day just like we had today. And then if we look at our Thursday planner, it's going to be, like I said, a little chillier when you're waking up, 39 degrees, getting warmer as we go towards noon, 44 degrees, and then dipping again towards 6 p.m., getting to 40 degrees, partly cloudy all day. So we'll be seeing the sun, like I said. And then since it's Syracuse, everyone's talking about the snow. Looking at our past snow days last year, 
the first snowfall was November 10th. So as we're already past that, or as we're coming up on that date, it's going to be getting, you know, a little bit closer to getting that snow. Like I said, we might be getting that snow that weekend, this weekend. And looking at our record temperatures, we were in between that today, not getting as high as 80 or as low as 21. Back to you guys. Coming up in sports, Syracuse basketball is officially back. Both the men's and women's teams kicked off their 2018 campaigns last night with huge wins. Highlights and post-game reaction is on the other side. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, let's crawl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, let's crawl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey, let's crawl. Hey yo, let's crawl. Boom. Taking care of a family member can lead to plenty of questions. Fortunately, there's a place to get the answers for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. And now, your Citrus TV Sports Report. Welcome back. I'm J.D. Arachi with Sports. There's been a lot of hype going into the basketball season here at Syracuse. A top 25 ranking, all five starters returning, a great recruiting class. Expectations are sky high for Jim Beheim's team. And last night, they got their first chance to show why. Syracuse opening up the season last night with a matchup against Eastern Washington. O'Shea Brissett, the sophomore small forward there, getting a little loose, and for good reason, he'd be active early and often in this game. Couple of minutes in, the hammer plus the foul for O'Shea Brissett. He flies to the rack, give him the extra point. It's 5-3 Syracuse at that point. And then how about Marek Dolajai stepping out outside his range, knocks down a triple. He's been working on that all summer. The Slovakian, a perfect three for three from the floor in this game. And Syracuse gave up 10 points in the first half. Second half now defense swarming once again. And there are the first points of the day for Buddy Beheim. The coach's kid getting involved on the pass from O'Shea Brissett. And now some nice ball movement. Looking like the Spurs out there. Jalen Carey, another freshman, knocks down the triple. Syracuse up big in the second half. And at this point, all it is is the dagger. Free throws matter, kids. Tyus Battle takes it through a couple of defenders, knocks it through with a hammer. Syracuse, an absolutely dominant game. They win 66-34. Defense was great all game. And O'Shea Brissett says even though they only gave up 34, they could have had some better, some better opportunities defensively. Coach definitely wants to be a lot, a lot more active than we were in the first half. Um, you can see in the second half, that's where we started to get you know, our steals. Um, and, you know, I got to... It wasn't just myself, you know, other guys, it's a, it's a team effort, you know, when everyone has, has their hands up and is moving uh, all in sync. So, you know, I'm happy we were able to get those stops and coach is really happy we were able to do it too. Syracuse women's team also opening up their season yesterday. Number 18 Orange taking on North Dakota in the Carrier Dome. Down 6 nothing early, but then the superstar Tiana Mungakahia breaks the ice for the Orange. Knocks down a triple from straight away. And Syracuse would eventually start to pull away in this game. Second quarter now up three. How about three more? Emily Engsler, the number nine recruit in the country. Her first three points of the day. And then later in the second quarter, Kiara Lewis, the transfer. 
from Ohio State cashes in from deep. Engsler and Lewis each had 13 points apiece to lead the team, but it wasn't all offense in this game. Engsler on the defensive and swats it away, capping off a fantastic win, 85 to 49, the final in favor of Syracuse. And Coach Q had high praise for his freshman after the game. I thought that Emily really came in and played, played, played well. Like I told you guys, you know, media day and and every interview, she's a, she's an explosive scorer, and she can score from every every spot on the on the floor. Um, I, I think it's just about her just getting used to the pace of the game, getting up and down the floor, and and just staying disciplined in our defense. But she she did a good job of that too. I thought she didn't, you know, she made very few mistakes on the floor today, and that's going to keep her on the floor and playing major minutes. Um, and lost among opening night in college basketball. The college football playoff rankings for week 11 were released last night. And the big climber, none other than the Syracuse Orange. SU all the way up to number 13 in the country in the newest poll. That's the highest ranking since 1998 for Syracuse. Dino Babers and company get their next chance to move up even further when they take on Louisville at 7 on Friday in the Dome. All right, J.D., so we had a great performance from Emily Angsler, which you were there. You saw that happen. Jalen Carey, his first performance, also very good. Who was better? Who's the better newcomer? I, I think it's going to have to go. We're going to have to go with Emily Angsler. Team leading in the points, three of four from beyond the arc, and the nasty block defensively. One of the most exciting blocks I've seen in person. Emily Angsler is going to be a superstar for this team. Oh, yeah, she's just a talent. Thanks so much, Undoubtedly. J.D. Really appreciate it. Coming back with more after this. Hey, look, it's those guys. Are you good to try? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Welcome back to Citrus TV News. We have our weather anchor Amber McElrath with us. Now, Amber, chilly mornings the past couple of weeks. Any change tomorrow? It's still going to be chilly tomorrow, but the sun will be out, so you won't need an umbrella or a rain jacket. So even though it'll be chilly, it'll be a nicer morning than we've been seeing the past couple weeks. If you look at the rest of the week, it's going to be partly cloudy tomorrow, like I mentioned, and then that sun's going away. Friday, it's going to rain, and Saturday, we might see our first snow shower of the year. PM snow showers on Saturday, and on Sunday, it's going to be cloudy, so that sun's going to go away on Sunday, too. Back to you guys. All right, Amber, thanks so much. And we have some news that might affect the entire galaxy tonight as new studies suggest that a laser might be able to attract aliens. That is, of course, if, if they're out there. Well, yeah, that's right. According to MIT research, a large laser generating one to two megawatts and pointing towards space might be the key to getting the attention of extraterrestrials, a more complicated strategy than just phoning home. Of course, the, the strategy used by E.T., the extraterrestrial, don't want to spoil spoiler, the ending yeah, spoiler of the movie, alert. of course. What are you yeah. doing? But, well, I mean, it's a happy ending. He, he goes home. Do you think that we actually have aliens out there? Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all the time we have for you today. Thanks for joining us here at Citrus TV News. I'm Jack Watson. And I'm No Eagle. For the latest information, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Citrus TV News. Have a great evening, Siri.